We're delighted to have with us for the balance of the program, Eric Schuster, who is a writer, has been a businessman, entrepreneur, and uh, he's done a lot of work uh, in the question of Christian unity and has written a book with the intriguing title, Where Are the Christians? The Unrealized Potential of a Divided Religion. Eric, welcome to today's issues. Good morning, gentlemen, and we can talk football, too, if you like. There you go, hey. Eric. Now you're talking. Now you now 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 you're talking our language right there. You know. <laughs> yeah, we uh, uh, we we are glad to have you on. What uh, what motivated you to write this? You know, I've, for, it's been painful in 50 years to watch the United States go from what I remember being a God fearing nation of people who lived Christian values to this. God ignoring nation of people who have forgotten what Christian values are. I mean, Christianity has been fragmented in terms of denominations for centuries. But, you know, somehow the U.S. has found a way to come together respecting some of those theological differences and really, really focusing on the common good. What I see now is Christians in America just dividing themselves along these, these, uh, these denominational lines. And really what's happening is Christianity is now losing its influence spiritually, socially, and politically, and it's failing to reach that fantastic potential it has in Jesus Christ. So I thought, by giving a little bit of history of Christianity and diving into what uh, what a Christian is, mm-hmm. examining the various Christian types and discussing how we could come together, that maybe we could wake up and stop the zombie walk uh, that America is doing spiritually. You know, if you go back and look at our history, I'm talking about the American history, Eric, and you've done this in your book, I know, but uh, in your research... Uh, you go back to uh, the founding fathers, obviously, uh, and they. Uh, you read their writings, and uh, the Christianity was, you know, a major part of the early development of, of American uh, life and government. Then you move up to, um, I mean, it, it, you could we could quote from the, you know, from the uh, from George Washington's farewell address, you know the father of our nation in the middle of his farewell address, he says that religion and morality are indispensable pillars, uh, of society. I'm quote, I'm almost quoting verbatim there, but that's so. And then you move up to the middle of the 19th century with, uh, Alex de Tocqueville, you know, the French historian, uh, philosopher, uh, writer, he comes over here and he says, and again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, wow, Christianity is taken seriously over here. People live it out, uh, and it's a huge part of what makes America distinctive and special. And then you move up to uh, 1892, I guess it was, and you have the United States Supreme Court itself declaring that uh, the evidence supports the idea that America is, in fact, a Christian nation. So, I mean, uh, for those who want to deny what I've just said, the facts are there, I guess they – are they just Christian haters, Eric, or why – I get when I talk about this stuff, I get this. You'll get these people. Not there's not very many of them, but you. They're oh, it was deism that was the big thing, uh, you know, in founding this country. Uh, deism. Uh, deism is defined as uh, a god. Uh, that is, no, there may be a god out there, but he doesn't intervene in the affairs of man. And if you look at the the, the, the writings of our founding fathers, for example, they believed in the God of the Bible, that God did intervene in the affairs of man. Go ahead. Yeah, the, I mean, in terms of the founding fathers being deists or whatever, that's that's why we get back to values. Because what the founding fathers didn't spend a whole lot of time doing is debating theology. Right. What the founding fathers did a lot of doing is debating how a gr- how a great nation can be formulated. And in formulating the great nation, there is undeniably Christian values that are intertwined throughout the Constitution throughout the Bill of Rights, and those those things that we can all grasp onto, whether you're a Catholic or a Methodist or a Baptist or Evangelical, whatever you might be, the idea was is that all could come together and say, I believe that too. I live that or I try to live that, and when I fall short of that in Jesus Christ, I can go ahead and repent, and, and I could be a part of this great nation. What has happened over time is when we look at Christianity, it's really become a... The Catholics saying, look, we believe what we believe, and you evangelicals and you Lutherans and so forth, and evangelicals. I mean, the idea that we've just sort of separated ourselves, it's, it's a self-inflicted wound 
there's an understanding there's not going to be theological alignment amongst the 33,820 denominations, according to the World Christian Encyclopedia, that there are. And that's why, if we could come back to the value... Hey, there's that, another one, Eric. I just formed one uh, yesterday. So that would be 3,000. How many now? That's 33,821. Yeah, 21, because I just started a new denomination. Anyway, I just wanted to bring you up to speed. Do you mind to correct your book? And, and, and when you actually read read what these are, I mean, there's a church for everyone. I mean, there's the, one of the great strengths of Christianity is that there's a brand for everybody. Mm-hmm. If you can, you can go to the cowboy church, the snake church, the motorcycle church. You can go to any church that you can possibly would want. But that's also the greatest liability is that we're so fragmented. Mm-hmm. And because we're so fragmented, we can't seem to consolidate this influence. And so those Christian values now are going by the wayside because we're so vulnerable to the attacks of a liberal few who are able to to essentially point the finger at well, Christianity and say that's the problem. I've told They're people, stopping us from progressing. Yeah. The book is called Where Are the Christians? The Unrealized Potential of a Divided Religion, uh, written by Eric Schuster, who's our guest with Ray and me. You know, I've... Uh, I've tried, you know, in our work here at American Family Association, obviously we are a uh, a, a Christian uh, group, and we're evangelical if you want to look at our statement of faith. But, uh, Eric, <clears throat> I tell people, you know, we can we can have discussions uh, on, on theology and, uh, you know, between various groups of, of people, and, and we should, and that's healthy. I, but but when it comes to the the Christian values that we all basically agree to, uh, which which we understand that's the best for society at large. That's when we can. That's when we, certainly we can come together and work together on those kinds of moral values that are good for society without you know quote compromising our uh, our core convictions of whatever denomination or particular brand of Christianity we are. Is that, do you agree with me or disagree with me on that one? Correct. Really, if we look at it from uh, from a continuum, you've got, for many, their faith in Jesus Christ is a very personal thing. And so they can go ahead and read the Bible and, and come up with a testimony through the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, his ministry, and so forth. That's an individual. Then you can take that to the church. And then the church community can build upon that. And you can have faith within a community of, of common belief and common theology. Then when you get from the church to the community, now you've got a lot of different churches. And you, you don't have to sacrifice individual belief and church belief right. to come together. For instance, in California, not too long ago, there's something called Proposition 8 right. that passed. And it passed because you had Catholics evangelicals, you even had Mormons who many don't even believe are Christians, who all came together and said, listen, we're going to pass this thing, and we're going to set aside our differences, and we're going to come together for the common good. And they did it. In the most liberal state in the Union, Mm -hmm. they passed essentially the greatest defense of marriage uh, piece of legislation that there ever was. That's an example of what can happen when we come together around the values and say, listen, I'm not going to sacrifice my theological beliefs because they're sacred to me, but I will get together with you and work in the community because we have a common goal. Eric, I'm looking at your book, and uh, if you if you go all the way down to section three, because I just there's a couple things here really fascinated me. You've got section three is called "Where Are the Christians?" A categorization, and you talk about a couple of categories very interesting. The there are some who are leaving, losing their belief, departing Christians. They're hiding, not practicing their faith. You call them adequate Christians. And then the then this chapter 11 is they're vacillating, living under their poti- potential or hesitant Christians. And then you there's one more category of laboring Christians, those who are active in discipleship. Talk to us about uh, how would you come up with those categories and who are these different groups? But as I, as I synthesized, and I'm a, I'm a market researcher by, by trade and an engineer by education, and so there's a lot of data out there that we can go ahead, and folks like Barna and Pew have done a great job of giving us these, these data sets in the National Survey of Youth and Religion. And, and 
I went on the basic hypothesis that, that the question of are you a Christian is not entirely relevant anymore. And, and the reason why is that there's just too many kinds of Christians. I met too many people saying, I'm a Christian, and then when, I would, when we would start discussing, it was, it was clear that they hadn't practiced Christianity for the longest time. Then you've got some who were just great believers and practicers, so I said, you know what, let's see if we can identify the types of Christians that are out there, which is not a unique exercise, but it was unique in the way we went about it. So the idea was, I found departing Christians, people who said, look, I'm a Christian, but they're sort of one foot in, one foot out. They're not even sure if they believe anything anymore, but they're still sort of in because, you know what, something in their life could light a fire and they could basically become active again, but right now they're just sort of departing, they're leaving, they haven't entirely left the building. Adequate Christians are those who just sort of the average Christians. Those who feel, look, I, I believe in Jesus Christ, I don't need to do anything more. And they're like, well, what do you mean? Well, I look, I wear my crucifix and, and uh, I, you know, just, just don't talk to me. I don't need to share my faith. I just need to be left alone. The hesitant Christians are those people who actually had really strong faith in Jesus Christ and in his ministry, but they were just sort of hesitant to go ahead and go out there and, and exercise. They had this huge potential of doing good in the community, doing good in their families, and so forth, but they were just sort of brought back by, well, look, I'm kind of busy this weekend. Um, I want to spend time with my family. Um, I look, I'm not even sure how to get involved. I'm kind of uncomfortable going to a soup kitchen, so they're hesitant. The last laboring are those folks who live, they, they walk the walk, talk the talk. They're out there evangelizing. They're in the community. They're helping people. They're giving up their time and their money and their substance. So I found those four. There's a, there's a fifth one that, that uh, doesn't even bear mentioning, but these four were the kinds of Christians. And when we actually understand who we're talking to, of one of these four, we're actually able to go ahead and have a much more productive conversation and even to witness to a large degree to somebody who maybe needs a little bit of lift. Mm. Uh, say something, if you would, about uh, your, your vision here at the end of the book in Section 4. How is Christianity to unite? You talk about the individual, the family, the church, and the community. I guess it always does begin personally with each one of us, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it does. And it, it, it starts with an individual deciding that they want a little more. To give you an idea, in, in Houston, Texas, when I lived there, there was an organization called the Houston Northwest Assistance Ministries. And this was a group started just by two people who said, look, there's a lot of needs in our community. Let's go ahead and figure out how to do it. And they formulated a board, and they just got churches to begin to join. And they had, some, they had a Jewish synagogue, and they had a few Christian churches. And then it was more denominations joining than they had some other folks join, and, and uh, the Mormon church came in and so forth. And then, then they had these 52 congregations who were working together, and I had the privilege of, of being able to work with them as, as a member of a congregation. And I was absolutely stunned at how much work could get done in the community when we're working shoulder to shoulder. And we got into some great conversations. We would talk about, well, what do you guys believe about this? And there was this respect about talking about that. There wasn't a, well, that, that's just wrong because of this Bible, biblical reference. It was more like, well, yeah, that's not what I believe, but this is how we believe that. And But we were working together towards a common good. That vision has really been proliferated through these types of organizations, interfaith ministries, if you will, all over the United States. So there are folks who are doing it. Mm. They're actually out there getting these congregations together to set aside those theological differences and work in the community. And what's happening when that takes place is folks are actually, you know, folks are actually able to, to better the community. And while bettering the community, they're bettering their churches and bettering themselves. It's just a, it's a great spirit when that happens. Eric Schuster has been our guest. Eric, your book is Where Are the Christians? And it's available everywhere. Where is it? Where do you get it? Correct. And all, all the usual outlets that you would expect, if you go to... Uh, if you go to www.findmychristianity.com, you can actually take a small little uh, survey that will categorize you into one of those Christian uh, uh, segments. It'll pr you can print it out, and we've had youth groups and others go out there, and everyone takes the test and comes together. It only takes you a few minutes and, and sort of talk about, hey, look, 
I may be a little bit lower on this one and a little bit higher on this one, so it's been a lot of fun. But you can get the book anywhere.